the standard that we actually did the best on on our EOG review were was in the Earth History unit, which makes me happy because that's one of the units that I like the most to teach. Um, the standards were 8E21 and 8E22. This presentation is what Delaney and Samantha done for their project uh, for Third Corps. They have to put a project together uh, to teach the class a standard during these 15 days. 8021 is understanding the history of Earth and its life forms based on evidence of change recorded in fossil records and landforms. We are to infer the age of the Earth and relative age of rocks and fossils from index fossils in the ordering of rock layers. We can also use relative dating and radioactive dating. 8E22, explain the use of fossils, ice cores, composition, sedimentary rocks, faults, igneous rock formations found in rock layers as evidence of the history of the Earth and its changing life forms. So we're looking at the evidence and how the evidence is used as to the history of the Earth. The Earth is 4.6 billion years old. Pretty old place. Okay. We know this because we studied fossils and evidence. And we used science to determine those. Now remember I told you that when we look at these things, we look at these from a scientific standpoint, not a theological standpoint. I'm fully aware that there are some theologies that believe the earth is five or 6,000 years old, and I'm not saying whether that is right or wrong. Science says it's 4.6 billion. That's what we have to learn for science. Fossils. Fossils are the remains or impression of an old organism that was preserved in form or as a mold or cast in rocks. So fossils are evidence of older life forms. You know, they say, again, we've talked before, a picture is worth a thousand words. When we have a fossil, the impression of a fossil in a rock, in a mold, in a cast, that's like having a picture. Okay? It allows us to see back in time. Most fossils are found in sedimentary rock. Sedimentary rock is rock made out of what? <clears throat> Sediment. It's not had any undue pressure, any extreme heat, any of those things applied to it that could deform or change the organism that was making the rock. In order to make a fossil, we need time. Okay? Fossils are formed over millions of years. We can't go out here and take a bone buried in the mud, go back in 10 days and have a fossil. It takes time. Over time, the layers are created and build up. This means that dead organisms' remains get stuck as more builds up on top. We don't need decay and rotten decomposers working on something if we want a fossil. We don't need any oxygen. We don't need any animals. That's why we normally find fossils buried in the ground. To where they've been protected. Here we see the remains of what looks like a turtle. 
Here we see the remains of what looks like a dinosaur. Okay? Three types of rocks that we have talked about. Sedimentary rocks formed by the deposition and cementation of materials at the earth's surface and in bodies of water. If we're going to form sedimentary rocks, we need a lot of sediment. Igneous rocks are rocks that are formed through the cooling and solidification of magma or lava. Are we likely to find any fossils in igneous rock? No. They would have been burned up. It's like cremation. If we drop something into a volcano, we're not going to get it back. It's going to be incinerated. Metamorphic rock, rock that once was in one form of rock but has changed to another from heat and pressure. Sedimentary rock is going to go through this process eventually if it remains long enough. Because the more materials that build up on top of it, the more what's going to be applied to that sedimentary rock? Pressure. Pressure. The closer it gets to the center of the earth, the more what's going to be applied to it? Heat. That will change it. Are we going to find very many fossils in metamorphic rock? No. Heat and pressure will change things. Here we see three examples. Sedimentary is in what? Layers. Igneous is full of what? Holes where it dries fast and leaves pockets. Metamorphic is kind of like a mixture. It's kind of like making cake with two or three different types of cake mix. It's kind of swirly, different layers, not uniform, because as it heats up and melts, it, it flows. Mold versus cast. A mold fossil is a space in a rock that has the shape of the remains of a living thing that one once occupied that space. Here we have an example of a mold fossil. It's like a cake pan of a different shape or a cupcake pan. Then we have a cast fossil forms when a mold is filled with sand or mud that hardens into the shape of the organism. This is something that we're used to if we go to the beach and we build sand castles, right? You can get the bucket in different shapes to make different looking sand castles or animals from the sand. This is a mold. This is a cast. We've got many different types of fossils. We've got petrified fossils, are fossils in which minerals replace all or part of an organism. Minerals replace what once was there as living material. We talked about petrified wood is a fossil of a piece of wood. But it's no longer wood, it becomes a Rock. Preserved fossil forms when the entire organism or parts of the organism are prevented from decaying by being trapped in rock, ice, tar, or amber. When the whole thing becomes encapsulated and it survived, it's protected from all the other elements that are out there. That's preserved fossil. It's almost like when you go to a taxidermist and get a deer head or a fish mounted. They are preserving it. Carbonized fossil are forms when organisms or parts like leaves, stems, and flowers 
or fish are pressed between layers of soft mud and clay that hardens, squeezing almost all the decaying organism away, leaving the carbon imprint in the rock. A trace fossil forms when mud or sand hardens to stone where a footprint, a trail, or the burrow of an organism was left behind. Simply a trace of it exists. Its track, its imprint. Mom and Dad created somewhat of a trace fossil. When you were born, if they took your footprint, put it on a piece of paper. Or they take your footprint when you're little and you go to Bible school or pre-K or daycare. And they put your hand in clay and make a mold of your hand. Okay? They're creating a type of fossil there. Index fossils. We talked about a fossil that is useful for dating and correlating stratum or periods. Remember the definition of a tri-index fossil is a species that lived a short amount of time but was abundant, plentiful, and found everywhere. Okay, we can index time with that. Okay, we know that this thing lived here in this period. It can't cross four or five periods. Okay, it identifies a specific time. That is an index fossil. Examples of index fossils, the trilobite, orthoceras, Amphibian or ammonites? The ones that we talk about the most are trilobites and ammonites. We discuss those a lot. Okay? We also, when we are determining these things, we need scientific methods. Carbon-14 is an essential part of half-life and it decreases by half every 5,700 years. We know the half-life of all active elements on the periodic table. Half-lives have to do with radioisotopes which are elements that contain different numbers of neutrons because we can't change the number of protons, can we? If we change the number of protons, we make a new substance. Neutrons, however, can change. The half-life of zinc, 71, is 2.4 minutes. If you had 100 grams at the beginning, how many grams would be left after 7.2 minutes? Well, we know that it would go through how many half-lives? Three. We determine that by going 7.2 divided by 2.4 gives us three half-lives. We can go... One a 100 to a half, which is 50, that's one half-life. And then 50 goes through another half-life, and that leaves 25. That's only two half-lives. we got to go through another one. We take 25 through a half-life. That leaves us 12 and a half grams, or one-eighth of what we originally started with. Always know that half-lives are different for every element. Now, could we use zinc-71 to determine the age of a fossil?
Nobody? No. We would have to start out with so much if we know that it takes a million years. How many half-lives would we have to go through to get there? Well, 2.4 minutes out of a million years. I hate to do the math, but it probably would be thousands of half-lives. <laughs> we would have to start out with way too much zinc. Therefore, we use other elements. OS-182, <clears throat> 21 and a half hours. How many grams of a 10 gram sample would have decayed after exactly three half-lives? We simply break it down three times. Half, half, and half. To where we've got half of 10 is 5, half of 5 is 2 and a half, half of 2 and a half is 1.25. Faults and unconformities. A fault is a break in the earth's crust where slabs of rock slip past each other. Faults are caused by the movement of tectonic plates during earthquakes. We know that the plates on the earth's surface are floating. They're like boats on the ocean. We know that the inner core of the earth is molten material and it flows through a process known as convection where the hot material falls and the cold material rises. Now hot and cold relative in this because the hot material never really gets cold. It's cooler. Unconformities are the contact between sedimentary rocks that are significantly different in age or between sedimentary rocks and older eroded igneous or metamorphic rock. We see here we've got angular unconformity. That means where we've got layers that are horizontal and then we've got layers that are at an angle. Something had pushed them up. Something has changed the way they're laid. Here we've got a disconformity to where we have missing materials. It doesn't look normal here. It's been eroded out. Nonconformity is when we have layers of different direction, different material, and it does not follow the law of superposition. How can we tell the age of a fossil? Well, a paleontologist is one who studies fossils. Paleontologists work hard to find information to help them determine how life was in the past and when the fossils formed. They are able to keep records of the data through graphs and charts. Now we've got two different types of dating when it comes to the rocks. We've got absolute age, which is the real age of the layer calculated with radioactive decay. Radioactive dating is the process of determining the age of rocks from the decay of their radioactive elements. This is the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 to show the age of the remaining specimens. Carbon-14, carbon-12, we use carbon-14 for radioactive dating. Radioactive dating is expensive. It gives us a better absolute age, but it costs a lot of money. 
Remember, absolute age is not like you or I or my age. I know that I will be 52 on May the 27th. Absolute age when we're dealing with fossils is kind of a tighter pattern, a tighter window, but we still can't say that it is 3,267,325 years, 212 days old. We don't get that exact. But it is better than relative age. Relative age is the method of determining the age of one fossil as it relates to another. Relatively speaking, I am old compared to you. There's nearly 40 years difference between us. In relative terms, I'm way older than you. But if we had two rocks that were relatively speaking old, there would be a lot of difference. A lot more than that. Relative to this rock, this rock is newer or older. We can determine that with the law of superposition which states that rocks on the bottom of an undisturbed rock layer are going to be what than those on top? Older. They had to get there first. We've got a geological time scale. It's a chronological dating that is used by paleontologists and geologists to show the relationship that occurred during the history of the Earth. This scale is divided into eons, areas, eras, periods, and epoch. Eon being the largest, epoch being the smallest. We can see by this chart that everything is broken down. It fits in a certain place like pieces of a puzzle. The law of superposition, as we talked earlier, states that the younger formed recently layers are found on the top and the older layers are found on the bottom. When we look at the picture on the right, what order did the layers occur? Okay, which is the youngest layer there? What did you say, Zach? E. Why E? E cuts through what? Everything there. Then what would be the oldest? Zoe, what do you think? D? D would be next. Okay? Because it almost cuts through what? What doesn't it cut through? It looks to me like it doesn't cut through the green right here. But the oldest is which layer? C as in cat, right? It's at the bottom. Ice cores. Ice cores tell us about the weather <clears throat> and the climate of the past. Now we can also find some fossils sometimes in ice cores. But mainly ice cores are used to tell us about the weather. Ice cores are core samples that show the Earth's climate. 
scientists have found ice ages study, by studying ice cores. They study ice cores by the layers, the gases, and the elements present in the atmosphere at the time. Gas bubbles are trapped. Dirt particles are trapped in the ice. And that gives us an idea of what was happening in that region at that time. Ice cores are going to be found in glaciers, the top of mountains that have heavy snowpack. They're not going to be found in the desert somewhere, are they? No. Evolution. Evolution is the process by which different kinds of living organisms are thought to have developed from earlier forms during Earth history. The theory of evolution was explained by Charles Darwin. Claire Patterson helped figuring out how the Earth was with the help of George Tilton by using and creating uranium lead dating. We see evolution taking place in lots of species. Evolution takes place in the flu virus. It mutates and changes. Evolution goes along with the theory of the law survival of the fittest, that the strongest survive. The ability to adapt is crucial to a species' survival. All of those things involve evolution. All right, we'll stop there.